Thank you, Mr. President, distinguished members of the Security Council. I'm honored to brief you today for the very first time in my current capacity. Now, as you know, the collaborative spirit between the leading parliamentary blocs four months ago allowed the consensual nomination of Mr. Addo Abdul Mati as the Prime Minister. However, to date, the government of Iraq remains incomplete. Four ministerial positions are still vacant, with three of them interior, <coughs> defense, and justice, the three of them being subject to fierce disagreements between political parties, parties and among political blocs. Within this context, multiple parliamentary sessions have been adjourned, interrupted, or boycotted. And as a result, the implementation of the government program has made little headway. As we speak, the Iraqi parliament is in a one-month recess and will only reconvene early March. Now, long government formation processes are not new nor unique to Iraq. However, in the Iraq context, there is a real urgency to complete the process without delay, to complete the process and to focus on rebuilding the country after years of conflict. Therefore, I would like to call upon the polit political actors once again, to call upon them to overcome political infighting and to demonstrate that political compromise can prevail in the greater interests of the Iraqi people. And in doing so, I would also like to remind them that there are excellent and experienced Iraqi women well qualified to perform the job. Now, Mr. President, ultimately, the people of Iraq are bearing the brunt of the political stalemate, bearing the brunt at a time when it's critical to address their needs and demands for better services, at a time when the Iraqi citizens ought to be able to rely on strong democratic governance and viable state institutions. So yes, it is high time to shift focus from factional politics and to invest efforts in addressing the immediate needs of the Iraqi citizens as further delays could give space to significant repercussions on the stability of the country. Now, on a more positive note, I am pleased to inform you that the 2019 federal budget law was approved by Parliament on January 23. Prior consultations, as well as effective cooperation, made this achievement possible. And the good news is that it does demonstrate that space for constructive political dialogue and partnership is out there. And I truly hope that we will see lots more of it in the months to come. The 2019 budget allocations for some key developments, uh, key development sectors such as electricity, do reflect the government's efforts to improve the delivery of basic services, but still allocations for the reconstruction in liberated areas are far less than the actual needs. Moreover, Iraq's state finances remain strongly reliant on oil sector revenues and thus very vulnerable to fluctuations in oil prices. Another positive step is last week's decision of the Council of Ministers to convert the government program guidelines into an implementation plan. It will allow for close monitoring of progress as well as accountability. Additionally, I would like to welcome the steps taken by governments to address corruption. Within the last month, the Prime Minister shared three meetings of the Supreme Council which aim to unify efforts to combat corruption by any party or person, regardless of their post or position. Now, the fight against corruption will not be an easy one, but it is a much needed one, as corruption is fast and per pervasive at all levels in Iraq. It is a much needed fight in order to revive public trust. And during our meeting in Najaf last Wednesday, Grand Ayatollah Sistani also underlined, among other things, but he underlined once again, the urgent need to show progress in fighting corruption. Mr. President, turning to relations between Baghdad and Erbil, I would like to welcome the agreement reached on January 16 to unify customs duties. A speedy implementation of this agreement should now be a priority for both sides. Moreover, the finalization of the 2019 federal budget guaranteed federal funding for salary payments to Kurdistan region civil servants as well as Peshmerga forces. And I would like to call upon both Baghdad and Erbil to capitalize on this positive momentum and to overcome their differences. 
At this very moment, there is little to report on the government formation within the Kurdistan region. As to date, negotiations continue. And in my meetings with Kurdish leaders, both in Erbil and Suleymaniyah, I emphasize the need to expedite government formation in order to serve the needs of the people of the Kurdistan region soonest. Some developments seem to be unfolding, though, with a possible session of the Kurdistan region parliament to be held on February 18. Mr. President, during this reporting period, Iraq's leadership has made significant efforts in recalibrating its external relationship, reaching out to many international, regional, and neighboring partners. Important as strength abroad and strength at home is a package deal indeed. During this period, Iraq has also received high-level international delegations seeking to engage with the new Iraqi leadership, and I truly hope that support for sustainable stability in Iraq will continue to be on top of the regional and international agenda, building upon mutual interests and in accordance with the principle, uh, principles of respect for Iraq's sovereignty and territorial integrity. <coughs> on security, Mr. President, security remains a concern. Although terrorist activity has decreased, has decreased during the past month, attacks have been carried out against both civilians and the Iraqi security forces. In short, despite its military defeat, ISIL continues to pose a security threat to Iraq and the region. Another concern relates to armed groups operating out of state control and or armed groups expanding their economic and social control in Iraqi daily life. Now, regardless of their affiliation, the government needs to take quick measures to reform its security sector and act firmly against these groups and their activities. As you are also aware, Turkish military airstrikes near the Iraqi-Turkish border in northern Iraq have been condemned by Iraqi authorities as violations of its sovereignty. Turkey maintains these airstrikes are against PKK targets. Now, I do regret the loss of civilian lives and the loss of civilian livelihoods during these operations. And it is important that both the governments of Turkey and Iraq accelerate their efforts to resolve this through bilateral dialogue. Mr. President, elections. Meanwhile, the Independent High Electoral Commission, IHAC, has formally recommended that Iraq's provincial council elections take place on November 16. UNAMI will continue to provide technical assistance and support to IHAC. However, in preparation of these elections, a number of steps will need to be taken urgently by the government of Iraq and the relevant institutions. When speaking of human rights and accountability, Mr. President, I would like to emphasize that promoting a more consistent adherence to international standards of due process and fair trial is of the greatest importance as an impartial and transparent process of judicial accountability for the gross violations of human rights by ISIL. It will prove crucial in rebuilding peaceful coexistence and social cohesion. Now, equally important is the need to strengthen community cohesion and to counter collective community blame. Moreover, marginalization of one group over another leaves communities vulnerable to extremist messaging. Mr. President, on equal opportunities, as part of UNAMI's efforts to advance equal opportunities, I launched on January 24 the Women's Advisory Group on Reconciliation and Politics. And with this in mind, I would like to renew UNAMI's call to the political leaders to fulfill the many pledges made during election time, and thus to appoint women in senior decision-making positions. Mr. President, the United Nations and its humanitarian partners have finalized the 2019 Humanitarian Needs Overview for Iraq and will soon launch the Humanitarian Response Plan. This year, the humanitarian community will focus on meeting the needs of 1.75 million vulnerable Iraqis, including IDPs living both in and out-of-camp settings, returnees in areas of severe need, as well as host communities that have been strained by several years of armed conflict. 
and the needs are vast indeed. The 2019 Humanitarian Response Plan seeks $700 million from donors and contains specialized programming to address protection. And humanitarian programming will, of course, be implemented alongside recovery and stabilization efforts. Now, while significant efforts are underway to reconstruct infrastructure and to restore basic services, it will take many years and billions of dollars to rebuild the country. And Iraq will undoubtedly need the continued attention of the international community to make this transition successful and sustainable. Thanks to the generous support of the international community, the UNDP Funding Facility for Stabilization exceeded $1 billion at the end of 2018. However, a gap of over $300 million still exists. In other words, also here additional funds are needed, including contributions by the government of Iraq, which, by the way, does acknowledge the quick impact and efficiency of this program. It goes without saying that the UN country team, the UNCT, continues to assist the government of Iraq in meeting the needs of its citizens. And I can give you many, many examples, but some um, from the past few months. Um, for example, the provision of medical kits and supplies to save lives, the digitization of Iraq's largest social safety net, the provision of food entitlements, the clearance of explosives, and important, the finalization of a reconstruction plan for Mosul. The UN system also continued to support the government of Iraq in the implementation of some key reforms, such as in the security sector. And during my visit to Mosul a couple of weeks ago, I witnessed the important UNCT contribution assisting the government in the rehabilitation of houses, as well as the restoration of water plants, both essential needs, shelter and water, essential needs for the return of life to this war-torn city. Now, as you know, mine action organizations manage the threat of IEDs on a daily basis of great importance. However, it has to be said, further action is required by the government of Iraq to overcome certain challenges in facilitating these activities. Mr. President, since the Kuwait International Conference for Reconstruction of Iraq almost a year ago, the Iraq Recovery and Resilience Program has been rolled out. The program is nat national in its coverage and has a two-year budget of $1 billion. Resource mobilization efforts are ongoing with over $300 million pledged so far for projects. And I would like also here to encourage the other donors to contribute. Now, with your permission, Mr. President, I would now like to turn to the 21st report of the Secretary General on the issue of missing Kuwaiti and third country nationals and missing Kuwaiti property, including the National Archives. Let me first of all emphasize my determination to engage with this file. In my first official visit to Kuwait 10 days ago, I emphasized this once again. And while UNAMI continues to assist the governments of Iraq and Kuwait on this important humanitarian issue, I would like to call upon member states to strengthen their support. For example, through the procurement of field equipment, the provision of forensics, as well as capacity building for Iraq and Kuwaiti technical teams. The return of valuable Kuwaiti property last November was a positive and long-awaited step. And I encourage the Iraqi government to continue its search for the still missing national archives. Mr. President, in conclusion, I would like to underline that yes, the atmosphere of despair during the period of ISIL occupation has given some way to hope and optimism for the future in Iraq. However, one cannot shy away from the fact that the road to well-deserved long-term stability will be long and far from easy. Now, realism and great determination will be necessary in facing the challenges ahead, also on our side. An obvious ownership an engagement of all Iraqi components will prove crucial. Political will, a precondition, and taking pride in a shared history and a common future, a necessity. And yes, continued support from the international community will be of paramount importance. Finally, Mr. President, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to UNAMI and UNCT staff. I'm truly delighted 
to be working with them. And I look forward to reporting back to you on, I hope, some substantive achievements over coming months. Thank you.